Uh, this is a rather dramatic and unfortunate case of a person that presented with severe hemoptysis. This is bedside chest radiography obtained in the emergency room showing opacities in his right lower lung. A CT followed soon thereafter. I'm trying to find, here we go, these thin cuts. When I scroll down here, you can see the extent of the opacities that are accumulating in his right lower lung. And notice that when you compare the attenuation of the opacities with, say, muscle, that it is high, just visually consistent with substantial acute hemorrhage, then I'm going to bring alongside the axial the coronal say. So the finding of note is going to be right here. And when I get there, I'll zoom in for you, which is right here. And I'll bring it up on the coronal in a moment. But in looking at the pulmonary artery, and yes, there's also pathology in the adjacent airway, at this level here, we begin to see there is a mural abnormality involving the medial wall of that artery. And furthermore, one can also trace the passage of contrast medium contrast opacified blood from the defect in the pulmonary artery directly into the airway right there. And then more distally, one can see the contrast opacified blood moving distally in those airways, which are abnormal. So at this level, it corresponds to this region here in which we can see the same findings. So there is disruption of the medial wall of the pulmonary artery with the passage of the contrast of pacified blood into the lumen of the adjacent bronchus and then more distally. One can see that these airways are quite abnormal. There's intraluminal material. It's a little difficult to determine what's going on I would speculate that there is pre-existent accumulation of material in the lumens of these airways, proximal to behind the abnormal airway here. And there's also some abnormality within the lumen of middle lobe bronchi proximally. So this is a bad situation. And unfortunately, um, he did not survive this. So what is, is exactly going on there? I wondered whether there could be, sorry about that, um, a pre-existent lesion, maybe even including a non-metallic or foreign body of some kind that may have started in there and produced that abnormality and then became complicated by something else. But I don't know that, but I certainly wondered about that at the time whether there was a substantial intraluminal component that subsequently evolved to produce these other findings. Certainly on autopsy here, you can see that they confirmed the presence of that. They described that as a abscess and there were abundant rods and cocci gram positive in that region. So we certainly have a very focal airway centric infectious process that involved that part of the pulmonary artery. And that's pretty dramatic. I think it's the first and most dramatic one that I've seen that resulted in this. Any comments about what's going on here or why we might have this rather dramatic 
event. I've never seen anything like that. I mean, it's very dramatic, think, isn't it? Yeah, I think the patient just has some infection that invade, eroded in and I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just a terrible um, amount of hemorrhage. They couldn't get to angiography in time. Of course, they were planning to try and embolize that area. All right. Let me show you this case. There's some instructive things about this case of acute aortic syndrome. Let me start with these thins. We can see that there is a type A acute aortic syndrome. It's a communicating aortic dissection to and false lumens in the aorta. Now, when I go down from this level more inferiorly, so here we can easily see true lumen and false lumen. And here when we get to the aortic root towards the aortic annulus and the aortic valve, you can see that we still have an intermomedial flap down here. Of course, it's moving because of cardiac pulsation and the beating heart. And when we look down here, it grows pretty far down. Now, between this region here and more inferiorly, at least for a short segment, we have a relatively empty aorta here. So we see the flap and then we sort of see a bit of it further down. But there is a portion of the aorta that here appears relatively empty. So when one sees that, one should wonder about the situation in which one has a circumferential tear of the aorta. In that situation, depending on the extent of the tear and so on, one may get a situation where the distal flap may, doesn't have to, but may go distally and form an intimo intimal intersusception, kind of a windsock phenomenon. But in relation to the proximal intermomedial flap, and here's sort of an empty portion of aorta, it may prolapse backwards through the aortic valve in diastole. So you one may get to and fro movement of it. And if the valve, excuse me, if the intermomedial flap does that, one may see that it on ultrasound goes through the valve and prevents coaptation of the valve leaflets in diastole with associated aortic regurgitation. And here you can see some movement of the intermomedial flap in relation to the aortic valve. And that was identified on cardiac ultrasound. So that's one finding. Let me show you another thing. After they repaired the aorta and did a hemi arch, I came across the case in seeing a post-op image. And let me show you that. So he had replacement of the ascending aorta. He had an hemi arch and they also placed a frozen elephant trunk, an endovascular graft in the distal aortic arch and descending aorta, which surgeons here are doing much more frequently in the context of a type A acute aortic dissection. The idea generally behind this is to try to stabilize the true lumen, to try to occlude any tears that may be present there in order to try and prevent continued perfusion of the false channel and so-called negative aortic remodeling that may occur over time. Now, in looking at this aortic arch post-op, you can see we have a situation where there is still some passage of contrast to pacified blood into the false lumen here. And if you actually try to determine where it is actually coming from, it is coming from the base of the brachycephalic artery. So let me go back now to the pre-op procedure and show you the pre-op image. And again here, this is why it's important to identify 
not just the flaps, but to look for any fenestration or communications between the two lumens at any location. And if you look at it here, you can see there is a communication between true lumen and false lumen right there, very close to the origin of brachycephalic artery. And let's see if I can show that to you here as well. In relation to the brachycephalic artery, and you can see that communication. So I do wonder for sure whether had the surgeon known that in advance, that instead of doing a hemi-arch, which is here, he would have done a complete arch to try to deal with that communication between the two lumens at the time of the initial operation. Because now they're faced with this somewhat of a dilemma post-op of a persistent communication between those two lumens in the post-op setting. And of course, this frozen elephant trunk, um, the proximal landing zone, of course, obviously does not get to where the persistent communication is. What do you guys think based on your experience? I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, but I think it is important to to look for that. Uh -huh, for you sure. Know, we typically describe the um, intermomedial flap, its relationship to brachycephalic vessels and so on and so forth. But I think pre-op one should carefully look for any communications between the two lumens, particularly in the proximal descending aorta. Um, I noticed that surgeons will look for these flaps during the time of surgery and in my experience, based on the practice here, they will sometimes put in this endovascular stain graft, the frozen elephant trunk, even when they don't see a tear preoperatively or intraoperatively in that location. But I do think they have a bit of a dilemma now because they have this persistent communication. Howard and everyone else, when you guys report aortic dissections, do you use any sort of template specifically tailored to the dissection? Or are you just more descriptive? I'm descriptive. I know there is something called, by some acronym in which you make certain observations called dissect or something. I don't remember the components of it. I've toyed with the idea of a template so that one can be reminded to look for these kinds of things, but I haven't gone that far mm -hmm. yet. What about Peter and Brian and Travis? I'm, just, I'm descriptive. Me too. Okay. Yeah. Same here. I was just, yeah, we don't see, a, I think more of our dissections are transfers than um, de novos. Yeah. The, um, it's a good question, though, because in uh, 2020, the Society of Vascular Surgery has, you know, they, they released their new, like, classification uh, with, uh, new, like numerical classification for where the proximal extent and distal extent are. Um, I can find that. I, I haven't used it though. It's pretty, it, I saw, I think it was in an STR talk where somebody was going through it and it's a little, uh, it was a little uh, complicated, but our surgeons haven't asked for it yet either. Okay. All right, that's that's a beautiful case. I've never seen an intimo intimal uh, in a susception that goes uh, retrograde like that. Um, do yeah. they have any uh, echo or ultrasound images of the head and neck vessels preoperatively? No, no. Um, this one doesn't show what you sometimes might see, which is a distal intimo intimal intersusception where the intimo medial flap itself, like spaghetti will go into a brachiocephalic artery or so. That can happen, but it's not present in this particular case, but I have shown some of that before, where the distal intimal, intimal intersusception may result in the flap entering into or narrowing the brachiocephalic vessels, but they will deal with that at the time of surgery. Yeah. And I, I think that, I remember Seth showed one a few years ago that was one of the scariest cases where it, it was the left subclavian artery that was just focally occluded in its origin. It was because the entire flap had intersusepted into it. 
okay. and it was it was kind of subtle unless you look just right at the at the origin yeah so sometimes the flap extends into these brachiocephalic arteries it's not really yep. interception it's just extension of dissection into those branch vessels right but yeah the case that seth had it was there was no flap visible in the aorta because it had completely you know torn 360 and and intercepted seth's not on here is he i think it was probably a case when he was back in maryland yeah that may certainly happen yeah exactly let me show you This one is nice from the point of view of imaging, and then I'll show you just because I do have them annotated slides. Now, in this particular person, I did not personally report this CT in this patient. So let me scroll through it for you for an ILD case. So here is what the lungs look like. You begin to see mosaic attenuation pattern. I will show you a couple of expiration images in a moment. The dominant finding, of course, is the mosaic attenuation pattern. There is a more attenuating focus of abnormality there, but it's basically a diffuse pulmonary hyperattenuation pattern with a mosaic pattern as well. And here I'll bring some alongside. You can see the air trapping very nicely demonstrated in this patient on these expiration series. And again, I would have reported this as typical of non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis in a patient with a clinical diagnosis of an interstitial lung disorder without apparent cause. Um, I think this is, is very typical for it myself. And that's indeed what it turned out to be on surgical lung biopsy. So here are some images. It's an airway centric process. And I will show you here in a moment, but you can see there are foci like this, in which you can see the very dark pink staining uh, bronchial epithelium, but it's not confined just to the airway. So down here, for example, and here is a mag view. This is a very nice example of what is called peribronchiolar metaplasia, where you see the bronchial epithelium not confined to just the bronchiole, but extending away from it, sometimes called lambertosis, because the idea is, and it's probably simplistic, that there is extension of that through canals of Lambert. But that is not particular to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, but may be seen in that as well as chronic and even fibrotic hypersensitivity, but other bronchiolar disorders. But we do have very nice granulomas. Here are some of them. The loose interstitial granulomas typical of HP. Here is more of the same with even a giant cell. Arrow points to the giant cell. We have the bronchiolar metaplasia. We've got the other so-called loose interstitial granulomas. So a super nice typical case of non-fibrotic HP. Would anyone have suggested just based on the pattern alone, anything else? I think this is very typical for it. I agree with you, Howard. Yeah. Any, did, I'm sorry, did they find an, uh, a causing antigen? Nope, apparently not. Hmm. One would think that if they did a BAL, they would have found a lymphocytosis, presumably, and been yeah. able to make a clinical radiologic diagnosis of the entity, I think, short of an open lung biopsy in a case like this myself. Agree. I don't think we would have biopsied this. Yeah. All right. Those are my cases, uh, Jeff. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. I love I love the path picture. That's such a classic example. And Yeah. And in my experience with our multidisciplinary conference, I, I would say many of the cases of fibrotic lung disease that have peribronchiolar metaplasia end up being, we at least we come to a consensus of fibrotic HP. I think it's a very helpful finding. It's not specific, but in the right context, it's 
a very useful finding. Yeah, this is a lovely demonstration of, yeah, it's of that. beautiful pictures. Okay, who would like to go next? I've got a couple, Jeff. All righty. So I hope people can see a chest radiograph with a few peripheral kind of fat looking septal lines, mostly mm -hmm. in the upper lungs on both sides. Um, so it's not normal, but kind of nondescript. You know, usually edema is worse in the bases than somebody who's been standing up. You can see that there's some thickening of the fissures, which kind of goes along with that edema look. So CT to the rescue. Let's see if it's real. Um, lo and behold, there are lots of septal lines and some smudgy ground glassy stuff too. Uh, fat, fuzzy fissures. Um, bizarre distribution though for lung edema. Um, nothing in the way of central obstructing lymphadenopathy that might be clogging up lymphatics or veins or anything like that. Kind of hard to pin down. Um, let's look at the abdominal part of the CT. Nothing very scary down there. On uh, sagittal view, we can see that there are some bone lesions, some sclerotic bone lesions here, and um, including some sacral sclerosis. <clears throat> and on distal extremity CT, there is a sclerotic focus down here. And then on a PET CT scan, we see that there's uh, there's increased uptake in long bones here. So we have both femurs, proximal uh, tibia seem to have a little excess uptake and the proximal uh, humerus as well on both sides. And those sclerotic things in the spine don't seem to be lighting up in particular. So they seem to be quiescent. Also, the sacral lesion is not lighting up as far as I can tell here too. So it's kind of hard to put this whole case together just from the imaging. Any ideas? You know, I was thinking, could this be like metastatic breast cancer with sclerotic bone lesions if the person had had chemotherapy or something like that? Some some weird non-Langerhans cell third eye you know, tester type thing, uh, leukemia, mastocytosis. Okay. Got it. Okay, so um, you guys are all over it. So this is Erdheim Chester disease. Wow. And the you know the bone marrow was biopsied, the sacrum was biopsied, a spine lesion was biopsied, and they did not find histiocytes in that. So those might be inactive lesions that had sort of burned out and were just left with bone sclerosis. The person was anemic, so it's possible that the marrow was just uh, very stimulated, um, and that's why the marrow is lighting up everywhere on the on the PET scan. Um, <clears throat> and the diagnosis was made then from finding the characteristic mutation in peripheral blood. So it was a uh, the the classic sort of mutation that goes with Erdheim Chester uh, in the BRAF uh, pathway. So this is Erdheim Chester. Uh, we don't have lung biopsy to establish it, but uh, we know it can infiltrate the lung. We don't have pleural thickening here or mediastinal thickening or halos around the kidneys. So it's kind of a quiescent, I think maybe partly burned out Erdheim Chester. So except the lines were abnormal and then a lot of imaging is abnormal here and it's hard to put it together, but you guys, you did it. Wow. EC. Okay, so um, here's a person who has this uh, radiograph back in 2014, cigarette smoker, um, continues to smoke, um, probably has some emphysema up here. You can see some medial um, bullae here along the mediastinum, a little bit of scarring up here, not too scary of calcified granulomas here on the left and maybe the right. Uh, over the years now, we advanced to 2020, so six years later, we now see that there's cavitary 
abnormality here in the right apex, maybe with a fluid level up here, some cavities and some thickening over this, we still have the calcified granulomas there. And on CT, indeed we have this confluent set of cavities up here with thick walls and probably some fluid in the in the base of one of these things, not, not that impressive. And then perhaps some small airways um, downstream stuff here, some infection spreading down the airways. Here's another calcification over here. I think this is another calcified granuloma. So there were no splenic granulomas, uh, but there are these um, calcifications in the lungs. So this could be remote TB. Uh, you know, it could still be histo without anything in the spleen that does happen. Uh, and this, um, this is an infection here. Notice the emphysema. Um, the bullae along the edges, but central lobular emphysema as well, continues to smoke. And this is MAC, so mycobacterial infection. Person is managed on chronic antibiotic and the stuff kind of waxes and wanes. But this is MAC in the, this is one of the patterns that Jeff has described before, an older, uh, an older man, a smoker in this case. So this is not Lady Windermere's, it's not Mr. Windermere's either, or you know, Sir Windermere. It's uh, it's Mac and somebody who probably had pre-existing abnormalities that allowed colonization to occur. You know, defective clearance of these organisms that we inhale probably fairly frequently couldn't get rid of them, and then they took hold. Perhaps there was some bronchial obstruction by these calcifications or something like that. I don't see a lot of downstream bronchiectasis from this lesion but there was probably something pre-existing that impaired clearance and allowed MAC to take over in this case. Hmm. Okay, so MAC, maybe on top of remote TB. Um, I'll have to dig and see if anybody characterized his remote granulomas infection, what it, what it was. And um, then the last case I wanted to show is a um, woman who had this chest radiograph back in 2018 with some atelectasis in the right base here, a port catheter. So many years prior, she had had a stem cell transplant for treatment of CML. And um, so with her stem cell transplant, she had some respiratory difficulties and CT um, around that time, whoops, that's not the CT I wanted to show right away. Let me show you this CT. This CT shows some mosaic attenuation, not as dramatic as Howard's case, but still substantial amount of air trapping here. And I've got expiration to show you that there is uh, air trapping with this. So she had constrictive bronchiolitis um, as a result of her stem cell transplant. She had airflow obstruction and she got a lung transplant. So after a lung transplant, let me show you a more current chest radiograph. This is 2019 now. This is several, a few months after the lung transplant. I think about four months or so after the lung transplant. She uh, initially had much clearer lungs. Then she developed nodular abnormalities here in the lung bases, some consolidation and effusion. So we've got these uh, ill-defined nodules, patches of consolidation in the lung bases. Here's what it looks like on CT. It's actually fairly well-defined nodules, quite a, quite a collection of them. Uh, worse in the lung bases, which is kind of unusual for fungal infection. It's also not that common with nocardia. So uh, basal, you know, lung nodules in this population, think of aspergillus, cryptococcus, nocardia. Uh, this would be a lot of nodules for usual fungus. It, you know, I've seen some cases of nocardia that had lots of nodules, so that's on the list. So these, these were biopsied, and it turns out not to be uh, infection, but to be PTLD. Mm. So <clears throat> this woman had stem cell transplant, airflow obstruction, constrictive bronchiolitis, requiring lung transplant, and it's probably the lung transplant that led to these lesions. I don't think that these lesions are related to her earlier stem cell transplant, which was, I think, a decade before. So I think that was all under control, but with immune suppression, um, she had this activation of PTLD. So I think they found the usual EBV 
um, positivity in this in these lesions. So, uh, case of lots of PTLD nodules complicating lung transplant, but the result of earlier stem cell transplant. Some people just get all the luck. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, those are um, those are my cases. Thank you. All right, thanks, David. Wow. Travis had one he wanted to show here. Let me make him the presenter. All right, yeah, I'm just gonna show one because I know there are lots of other presenters here. And this is one that I need people's help on. This is actually for our, our ILD conference this week. And he's 67, this radiograph was done three years ago or, or thereabouts. And he's reported a history of, of dyspnea for going on 10 years now. And you can see, I think the radiograph just helps shows, I think there's some upper low volume loss. The high low look like they're elevated superiorly and some of these lower low vessels look a little elongated. And uh, so I think you'll see it's fairly symmetric process, but I will show quickly just the, this is the first CT, they're thicker sections. And then this is at that time, just to show that things haven't progressed that much. This is, I'll show a thinner slice study. There's a little bit of traction, but I think that there's just these large air spaces along the vessels. And it's more in the upper lobes, more volume loss there as we see, and it just kind of radiates out from the high low. And there's a little bit of ground glass opacity in the lower lobe. So I'm gonna to go to the thinner section slices, and then, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna need people's thoughts on this. I think maybe it's progressed some over the course of three years. He's had a surgical lung biopsy in the, min in the meantime, you can see a staple line there, and I'll show you the results because I think they're kind of interesting. But, you know, when I first looked at this, I was wondering, could this be some form of emphysema or or like even Langerhans, these are like, were these space, uh, like cystic spaces. But the more I looked at it with the volume loss, I was wondering if a lot of this is like paracicatricial emphysema. There's a little bit of, you know, bronchial dilation. I know David's shown very strange cases of, of alpha-1 causing bronchiectasis. I don't know you know, it's not necessarily that this is all bronchiectasis. It's just a very strange case. And I was wondering about exposures. He has no history of like prior uh, severe infection. Um, he works as a pastor and, you know, no great exposures, but we're kind of at a loss for this. But I think this is some form of just emphysema. So maybe even some weird elastase mutation or some other sort of genetic mutation causing his lung destruction. But I don't think it's sarcoid. Oh, I was just, just curious wonder, what others think. Could be like a weird burned out sarcoid, given the distribution. Yeah. Well, that's why I was first thinking like some sort of exposure or pneumoconiosis, even though you don't have the conglomerate fibrosis with that distribution. But oh, amyloid does when you think of amyloid. Hmm. No uh, signs or symptoms of connective tissue disease. That seems to be no. <laughs> unclassifiable right, right. diseases. Travis, where is he from? He's from somewhere outside of Asheville, North Carolina. So he wasn't in a forest fire or anything like that? No. Uh, you know, the, the, thing, the thing that I think argues against sarcoid is there's not actually a lot of scarring in those upper lungs. Yeah. You know, these really seem to be empty spaces, but their walls aren't thickened. Yeah. They don't seem to be scarred. I, I think this is some weird emphysema. And, you know, it's a, sort of a central distribution. I, I like your idea. Could there, it's too bad there's not more of an airway dilation to go along right. with the, you know, the elast, elastic tissue problems so, like right. Wood and Campbell. Um, well, I think it's bizarre. Um, yeah. Okay, good. I'd wonder about we're amyloidosis, all only because, yeah, amyloidosis should be considered, but the distribution is a bit odd. But I'm, I'm thinking yeah. more thinking of amyloid anytime you have emphysema, and it doesn't appear to be ordinary cigarette smoking related emphysema, cystic spaces as a component of the of the pathology. Well, Travis, do you have an expiratory on him? No, I don't. Um, um, he's a never smoker too, I may have mentioned that. I guess 
he, and I, I will tell you, his alpha one levels are normal. And I guess I still am not convinced this isn't some sort of, you know, mutation that could cause this. But let me show you. What about hypersensitivity? Like maybe his mold or something in his church? I don't know. I've never seen HP look like this because these are like just emphysematous spaces. Here, I'll show you the. So this is the surgical biopsy result. And this is from an outside hospital. And this, this patient's been seen elsewhere as well. But the major feature they were talking about was areas of hemosiderosis. And there is certainly centroacinar emphysema. And a few polarizable particles suggestive of silica. And now this, this is a report from an outside hospital. So our pathologists here haven't actually looked at this, at this specimen yet. Um, but you know, he doesn't have any history of, of some sort of like idiopathic hemosiderosis or any history of, of any of these other things. So it's, and his left heart's fine. So I think there's still a lot left to be desired. But I tell you, Howard, I like the thought of amyloid. I hadn't thought about that. You know, that's it. Right. Yeah. Um, Was there any calcification anywhere, Travis, on there? No. Just the staple line here. Yeah. The pathology report talked about parabronchial and other polarizable something. Um, parabronchiola needle like and yeah. puncti needle like. Oh, what does that suggest? And iron encrusted elastic fibers in vessel walls. I will. So I guess one of my questions, has anyone ever seen hemosiderin deposition lead to something like this? Um, I can't recall. Um, not yeah, that as I indicated, it's usually a disease of childhood. And the very few cases I've seen admittedly do have very bizarre imaging findings and a bizarre pattern of fibrosis when it occurs. That is the entity of what's called idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. Right. Oh, but I don't remember seeing one with what seems to be quite conspicuous emphysematous spaces that have, that has resulted from it that I can recall. So, so Travis, look. just because he's from uh, Asheville doesn't mean he's always been there. I just wonder if he was exposed to any iron mining or welding or you know iron foundry, some fumes and stuff like that, and right. the came from something inhaled. This is really the distribution of something inhaled. That's, the, yeah, uh, exactly. And that's why I was going to ask, like, you know, with that mention of silica, has anyone ever seen, you know, silica or other inhalational disease? Because that's what I was thinking too, was in, inhalational. But have you ever seen it without the conglomerate fibrosis with just a bunch of emphysema like this? No. No, no, no not quite. Like this. And the other thing, right. you know, is maybe just had a bad infection because I've seen infection lead to emphysema more than scarring. Sure. Um, so, you know, yeah, post that's another question that will be that will be asked. These are all great thoughts and will be very helpful. I'll let you know if we, you know, if we can come up with some, you know, more uh, more satisfying diagnosis as a multidisciplinary team. So, cool. Thanks. Is that path report? Ask them if he overread one or the local one that was done. I think that was one of the overread ones, but not overread here. He's okay. Been, this patient's been seen elsewhere. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'll I'll see what our pathologist says today. Maybe ask him if he's ever done any like fiberglass insulation work. Yeah, just any any sort of exposure. So. So Travis, right, thanks. Uh, there's a pathologist named Victor Rogley there who's really an expert in occupational lung disease. Okay. He, cool. he had no COVID history? Oh, this has been going on for years. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right, thanks, thanks Jeff. everybody. All right, Brian or Peter? I have a few. Uh, I don't know if Brian has any. Yeah, we got about Bingo. just over 15 minutes left, so. Do you have any, Brian, or? Uh, yeah, I got a couple. 
Okay, I'll, I'll show mine quick. I don't think I've seen Okay, it. no worries. Okay, Jeremy, you're going to go to this one. I have an ILD one, but it's much more classic and uh, straightforward, at least in my opinion. Um, so here, he's a 55 year old gentleman and he has a, um, I'll show the images and I'll tell them. So here's this uh, chest CT. So you can see a lot of mediastinal adenopathy with calcifications and then uh, mass like fibrosis in the upper lobes, uh, very lymphatic with um, calcifications. Um, this is his, yeah, this is the initial scan from 2016. Um, he also has some uh, reticulation and um, fibrosis at the lung base is kind of a UIP pattern. So he, he has a history of uh, silicosis, as you would uh, guess. Uh, it was biopsy proven. Um, and then here are some follow here are some follow up images. Um, so this is uh, on the left. So on the right is the original one, and on the left is 2016. And um, see so has some progression here to, um, in the lung bases. And then um, here is 20, um, the most recent scan from 2021. So this is just a case of uh, a patient with silicosis, and he was also diagnosed with uh, IPF uh, superimposed. Uh, he has a UIP pattern at the lung bases, and um, uh, this was diagnosed at one of our uh, multidisciplinary conferences. He didn't have any other reasons to explain uh, no connective tissue diseases so uh, what was this what was the source of his silica exposure uh, sandblasting worked as a sandblaster and he's a former smoker also so okay um, this one is another, just another quick one. This one was from one of our cardiac tumor boards and it came in yesterday. And I, it was read somewhere else. Uh, uh, the patient also had a cardiac MRI, which is read as a cystic uh, mediastinal mass. Um, I looked at the cardiac MRI, but I, I, I thought this, there's, there, the CT was kind of diagnostic for this, for me at least. Um, just mediastinal mass, essentially low attenuation. And then peripherally, this uh, kind of salt and pepper uh, uh, arterial enhancement. So that is pretty consistent with the periganglioma. And then there's a cardiac MRI. I didn't include the images because I didn't think it added too much. Uh, it wasn't with the, done with the exact sequences that would be the most helpful. But do you guys agree? Pretty classic. Yeah. It's good. Great location. Yeah, yeah, we've seen a few of them recently, uh, kind of large perigangliomas in the either subcranial region or mediastinum. But yeah, is that intrapericardial? I, that's that's that was a good question. I brought I told I told the surgeon I, I wasn't sure, and he said it doesn't really matter. He'll take it out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, but it seems like yeah, I, I couldn't make up my mind. But it seems like it's right right there. Yeah. Uh, it seems like it's got to be because you see that little claw extending to the between yeah, the root of the MPA like, and the aorta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, these these almost always arise from the like a, a cells uh, adjacent to the coronary arteries, uh, from my reading. Um, so and then they parasitize the coronary arteries. So yeah, yeah I, I think it would have to be intrapericardial. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was. That was, and then one last one, this one came in today also. We, we, uh, I don't have a whole lot of history on this one because we read it for, for an outside hospital that's actually out of state, but um, they sent the paperwork and then uh, the paperwork they said on echo, they were suspecting um, Chagas disease. So they got the MRI and uh, let's see here. So this is uh, this is just a kind of towards the cardiac uh, base, um, a cine, 
let me see where to play it. Mm. So you can see this uh, very thin, thin, thin uh, lateral wall here with uh, akinesis, actually even dyskinesis. This is the mitral valve, the short axis. Uh, and then a little bit spared, the myocardium's more normal thickness here, but uh, obvious uh, thinning in akinesis. Um, this is the uh, T2 weighted sequence, and you can see lots of T2 hyperintensity apex, and then here in the lateral wall, which we were showing earlier. So this is all inflammation, and then there's some inflammation at the RV um, apex as well. So kind of multifocal, patchy inflammation, and then um, these are some uh, delayed enhancement, uh, stack of delayed enhancement. And um, you can see this patchy enhancement. Uh, there's a there's actually an aneurysm here at the apex, uh, and as well as the uh, lateral wall, which are transmural. And then there's some uh, mid and epicardial enhancement. And this is just another um, another uh, delayed enhancement. You can see this extensive late gadolinium enhancement. So pretty good. Pretty consistent with uh, Chagas disease in the appropriate setting. Was there any and, esophageal uh, involvement? Good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there were no, okay. no esophageal involvement. It looks like there's like some secondary non compaction there at the lateral base. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I thought it was basically just an aneurysm, but yeah, you can see the, I guess it would be hard to, because if the whole myocardium is thinned in the actual native, the actual, do, do those do those measurements, the non-compacted and compacted myocardium, if the, but yeah. How did this person get Chagas disease? Almost no, unfortunately, almost no history. The only thing we got is some paperwork and on the, and they said on echo, uh, on echo, they based on the echo, and then I guess they have the clinical history. Uh, based on the patient's name, it would make sense that they were either from Central or South America, but um, I don't know how they got it. Cool. All right. Maybe from Peter. blood transfusion. Yeah, that's all I got. All right. Okay. Here you go, Brian. Okay. Cool. All right, so this is a, a bread and butter uh, trauma case. Uh, you can see uh, chest tubes, subcutaneous emphysema, lots of opacities in the lungs, um, and kind of a widened mediastinum. Um, here's a, a right IJ central venous catheter, perhaps pushed off to the, the right a little bit. Maybe the trachea is a little bit uh, put off to the right, but nothing terribly alarming, although the mediastinum does look pretty wide. It's not super dense. Um, went to get a CT after that, and uh, here's the non-con part of that. Um, and you can see there's uh, quite a bit of density uh, in the mediastinum. The, the trachea is medialized or pushed to the right. Um, and uh, there's a, a hyperdense uh, material present between the aortic arch um, and the trachea. On the CT, uh, you can see uh, that there's a, a blunt aortic injury with a kind of irregularity almost circumferentially. Um, involving the uh, aortic isthmus, so uh, probably like an aortic transection almost. There's a pseudoaneurysm uh, uh, appearance here, and then a pseudoaneurysm appearance here. Um, so that would be a, a grade three aortic injury in and of itself. Um, but uh, this is the first time I'd seen this. This, um, you can see there's a, a collection of contrasts coming off of one of the pseudoaneurysms. Um, and so I, I thought this was going to be more of a, a grade four with active extravasation, um, uh, as you can see this material. Uh, coming off uh, immediately there. Um, so I think here it is on the coronal, and that's pseudoaneurysm, which in and of itself is, is not a, 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 doesn't contain all three layers of the, of the aortic wall, and then um, actually a bit of contrast even beyond that, that uh, false aneurysm. Um, so grade four aortic injury, and sure enough, uh, the, uh, if you were to measure the, the thickness of the hematoma here, it's more than 15 millimeters. Um, second case, uh, this is a radiograph, a uh, young woman, I think cough, um, no, uh, no other clinical history, 
Um, maybe some airway thickening, not much. Maybe in retrospect something down here, but um, not much on the on the AP that caught my eye. I, I attributed this mostly to breast shadow. Um, here's the CT, and um, interestingly, uh, they, there was a PE study. Uh, they obtained it twice. I guess they weren't happy with the with first bolus, um, and and so we we get the advantage of seeing two different uh, the same pathology with two slightly different inspiratory efforts. Um, the it's probably inspiratory for both uh, exams, um, but you can see that the the trachea is perhaps a little bit larger on uh, the uh, bottom uh, uh, left image. Um, and uh, what we can see is a really extensive uh, bronchiectasis and airway thickening. Um, and then some areas of uh, what look like uh, mostly ground glass, peribronchovascular ground glass uh, and, and multiple different lobes. Here's some of the uh, apical right upper lobe. Um, and then uh, down here, um, this looks mostly like maybe some ground glass, maybe early crazy paving, um, and I thought it looked a little bit nicer here with a slightly lower lung volumes here. It looks more compelling, like crazy paving, almost becoming um, uh, consolidative at this point. Um, so, no, that's it. All right, thanks. Right. Can't hear you. What what did it turn out to be? Uh, that that one's uh, fresh off the the, the press, so uh, still uh, and and have no history. So still still waiting to hear back. Um, don't know yet. Do but you think, I, I do you think there's air trapping. Uh, yeah, um, I I would love to see a true expiratory in in this patient. I imagine there would be. Um, but I mean, but uh, that left upper lung in particular, the vessels are really sparse. I wonder mm. if Squire James uh, mm. leaving you know, from remote infection and leaving you behind with um, this airway constriction, bronchiectasis, and some of the ground glass could be the air trapping rather than a you know a ground glass pathology that could be more normal lung, at least some mm. of it. Uh, but I I think those vessels are really abnormal, especially in that left apex. Oh yeah, yeah, Waste that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there's this kind of global uh, bronchiectasis and, and airway thickening. So yeah, it could it could very well be like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, I have a few I can show. So this is a patient came in shorter breath, and you can see there's a large pleural effusion on the right, and uh, they shortly thereafter did another radiograph. Um, they did a little bit of thoracentesis. You can see it's improved slightly. And then this is uh, two days later, and you can see that aeration of the lung had worsened. Uh, so they got a CT scan, and this is a really, I thought, just a pretty example of, um, we've seen a case of this before, of what looks like re-expansion edema with this uh, sort of layering um, opacity in the lobule and, and Travis had sent around an article about the described like the karst mountains um, and I can pull up the PDF here uh, it's right here so this paper that was uh, in uh, cardiothoracic imaging um, from the I think the Stanford group uh, or I'm sorry UCSD group and you can see um, sort of this layering appearance there and they liken it to this uh, the karst mountain tops uh, from uh, Chinese landscape paintings, and karst topography is like the limestone type things that cause sinkholes and caves and stuff. But you get this erosion of the um, of the of the of the of the exposed rock, and it and it, and it cleaves in pretty sharp planes, giving it that jagged look. But I thought this was a pretty example, and I just remembered uh, Travis having sh had shared um, that article before, so I thought these were a pretty good look in there. All right, uh, I think uh, you guys will like this one. So this is um, kind of cute. So this is a case I saw recently. So this patient um, has emphysema and 
this was, I think, just a, a cancer follow-up or something, and has this funny bronchus right here in the apical right upper lobe. It looks like it's trying to be a tracheal bronchus, but if you follow it back, it just kind of stops there. Uh, but there is a little divot right here in the trachea, just at the uh, where the, the uh, azagus arches. So I thought it might have been a tracheal bronchus, and maybe something was wrong with it, but it had been looking like this for a while. So I found an older scan from way back when, uh, when this looked a little different. You can see, indeed, it is a tracheal bronchus. It just somehow has closed itself off, whether it's um, dynamic during inspiration or if there's just some inflammation that occurred there. But given that there was persistent mucus plugging on the follow-up ones, I, I think it's just chronically obstructed. But this, I've seen this type of tracheal bronchus. It comes off right at the azagus, and it tends to dip underneath it and sort of form a little hook. So it often has a very slit-like orifice there. And so I suspect these in particular are prone to uh, retain secretions, infection, and other problems like that. And then uh, last, and I don't remember if I've shown this case. I don't think I did because I came across it late last week. But uh, this is a good companion case to David's case. So this is a patient, uh, former smoker, bad emphysema, who developed this cavity uh, in the right upper lobe, very ugly looking with all this dense consolidation and then uh, consolidation elsewhere and endobronchial spread. So a good look for tuberculosis, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Um, so this was worked up and this actually ended up growing out um, all histoplasmosis. So this is um, a, a case of chronic histoplasmosis, which is, which is very uncommon. It mostly occurs in patients with COPD and it causes uh, upper lobe cavitary disease that is indistinguishable from uh, uh, the classical appearance of non-tuberculous mycobacteria or tuberculosis. And, uh, but this was, I don't have the follow-up imaging, but this responded to uh, uh, a triazole rather quickly and cleared within a few months, started to clear up a little bit. But it's just a very, very uncommon manifestation of histoplasmosis. All right, well, it's the top of the hour, so... Um, Thanks, everyone, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks, you. Thanks. Bye.